so Nicholas Allen, the director of the Wilson Center, who's a professor of English at UGA, um, is uh, going to say a few words on behalf of the Wilson Center where I work with him. Uh, so Nicholas, you want to take it away? Thanks, Dave, and welcome everyone. It's lovely to see you all, lovely to see so many familiar names and faces uh, from the neighborhood and around town and from much further afield there. So it's just lovely to see you. I'm Nicholas Allen. I'm the director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia. And I welcome you all to our conversation on Cool Town, the past and the future of Athens music, which is a celebration of the publication of Grace Elizabeth Hale's new book, Cool Town, how Athens, Georgia launched alternative music and changed American culture. And it's a bit of a family event this evening too, because uh, one of Grace Hale's daughters is a UGA student is with us this evening. So we're making that connection between Athens and Virginia tonight. And while this book may not enhance the scholarly reputation of the University of Georgia, this event is one wonderful part of the university's annual Spotlight on the Arts Festival, which runs for another week and which is packed with virtual events for you to enjoy. If you'd like to learn more, please check out arts at UGA or the Wilson Centre website. And I can see tonight our Provost and University, Jack Hugh and Marisa Pania Tower with us. And I'd just like to thank them both for the great support of the arts and university today. As I pass you over to my friend and colleague, Dave Marr, who will moderate and introduce tonight's panel, I'd like to thank you all for being here, for always being such good friends to the arts and the humanities in Athens, and to say that we keep you all in mind daily, as at last, all of our days begin to brighten. Dave. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, so I'm going to uh, fairly quickly uh, introduce everybody here. Um, and as I as I say each of your names, maybe uh, maybe I'll pause so you can say hello, and then you'll show up on the screen. So I'll begin with uh, William A. Miller, who we know affectionately affectionately as Montu. Montu, you want to say hello? What up? What up, Athens and everybody else? I think I seen uh, Doc Doc L. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing some good. I'm seeing some good faces. I ain't seen Doc in a long time. But anyway, what's up, y'all? Thanks, Montu. Uh, so Montu is originally from Minneapolis, and he's lived in Athens since 1999. He's a writer, poet, mentor, and community leader who serves on the Athens Cultural Affairs Commission, on the board of Chess and Community, and in various other local capacities through which he works to build bridges and give a voice to those in need throughout the community. As the co-founder and COO of Ath Factor Liberty Entertainment, he's long been a key organizer and promoter of the hip hop scene in Athens, uh, producing numerous series and showcases in a wide variety of venues over the years. He's a graduate of the University of Georgia in African American Studies. He's currently working with Professor Ed Pavlich on the DJ Summits project supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation through the Wilson Center. Montu, welcome. Uh, next, we go to David Barbie. Uh, David, you want to say hello? Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. There you are. Uh, David's been playing and recording and doing many other things involving music in Athens since the mid 1980s. His bands have included Mercyland, Buzz Hungry, Sugar, and his current band, The Quick Hooks, among many others. And he's engineered, engineered and or produced hundreds of albums by bands including The Drive-By Truckers, Deer Hunter, The Rocketeens, New Madrid, Muy Bien, many, many others. He's the owner of the recording studio Chase Park Transduction, the director of the University of Georgia Music Business Program. And for many years, he's been deeply involved with the local musicians aid nonprofit Nucci Space, as well as with Little League Baseball. David, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. On to Vanessa Briscoe Hay. Say hey, Vanessa. I'll say hello. Hi, Dave. How are you? Hi, Vanessa. Thank you for being here. Everybody, <laughs> Vanessa Briscoe Hay is an artist and musician who was the lead singer of Pylon, one of the seminal early Athens bands. 
with which she toured the world and made a bunch of great records. Uh, the two, the first two Pylon albums have just now been reissued by New West Records, both individually and as part of a beautiful super deluxe box set that includes a whole lot of extra stuff. Uh, you can see that at New West's website or at your local record store. Uh, Vanessa is a graduate of the UGA Art School. She was featured in the documentary Athens, Georgia, Inside Out. She's also played in Supercluster and now in the Pylon Reenactment Society. Vanessa, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And now we get to Grace Hale, Grace Elizabeth Hale. Grace, you want to say hi? Hi. There you are. <laughs> uh, Grace Elizabeth Hale is an award-winning historian and writer who's Commonwealth Chair of American Studies and History at the University of Virginia. An internationally recognized expert on modern American culture and the regional culture of the US South, she's written for many publications, both popular and academic, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, and has lectured widely in the US, Europe, and Japan. She's been on CNN, She's appeared in PBS and BBC documentaries, and she's won numerous prestigious fellowships for her research. Along with a great many articles, op-eds, and essays, Grace is the author of Making Whiteness, The Culture of Segregation in the South, 1980 to 1940, A Nation of Outsiders, How the White Middle Class Fell in Love with the Rebellion in Post-War America, and her newest book, Cool Town, how Athens, Georgia launched alternative culture and changed American culture, which is published by the Ferris and Ferris imprint of the University of North Carolina Press and is the reason we are all here this evening. Here is Cool Town. If you can, oh, you're, you're looking at Grace right now, but uh, I'll show you later. Uh, this book is an exhaustively and lovingly researched chronicle and a deeply insightful analysis of the music and art scene that developed in Athens during the 1970s and 80s. It draws on Grace's interviews with more than 100 people who participated in the scene at that time, as well as on her own experiences and memories as a college student, band member, and music venue owner in Athens when she lived here throughout most of the 80s and into the 90s. It's a brilliant work of history that could only have been created by someone who lived amid the events, places, and people it describes. Grace, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your book. Wow, well, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by that introduction. Thank you, Dave. Um, I've known Dave a long time and I, I never imagined we'd be here. Thanks. How um, about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's uh, let's just let's get right to it. Um, it's been a while since uh, since your time in Athens, since the 1990s, and during that time, you've you've done a lot. You've uh, you've built an established career. You're a highly respected scholar, professor of American history, and a writer. What led you to write this book about music in Athens? Well, to be honest, I was hoping somebody else would write it. <laughs> I kept thinking someone would. Um, you know, some other uh, scholar of U.S. Uh, culture or you know music history, um, or frankly, somebody would write a book about REM that would actually you know include the town as well. I know people have written books about REM. I should have said a good book about REM, and uh, I just kept thinking someone else would write it. Uh, that th this was not a job for me because I didn't have that scholarly objectivity. Um, or on the other hand, somebody would write it who was a participant at the center of the scene, somebody like Vanessa over here or, or David Barbie, you know, somebody that was right there in the center. Um, and they, you know, they just had other things to do, which is fine. 
Um, but but um, so I, I really had hoped someone else would write it. But when Vic Chestnut died in late 2009, I believe it was, that's when it dawned on me that people weren't going to be around forever to interview. Um, Vic was somebody that I knew well when I lived in town um, and, you know, that somebody was going to have to get started. Uh, and a good friend of mine, also a historian, Bryant Simon, told me that that somebody had to be me. So, you know, I think it's important that Athens has a, a history. Um, I know there have been other books about Athens, but I don't think they've tried to tell the story of the whole community in a, a serious, the whole music community of the 70s and 80s and in a serious way. And it's really a fascinating story full of fabulously interesting and brilliant people, some of whom are here today. So I, I don't have to really put too much into selling that aspect of the story. Um, but it's also really essential to American history to know this story, to know about the generation between the baby boom and the tech boom, um, music and life in the late 20th century US. You really need to know something about Athens. You can't understand countercultures and bohemias and how they do or don't work if you're only looking at New York City and the West Coast. And so I think there's really a story here that needs to be told both for just general readers that are interested and for scholars of American culture. Um, in the last quarter of the, of the 20th century, punk taught most of us that anybody could play music, but it was Athens that taught us that anybody could play music anywhere. All you needed was a few of your like-minded friends, um, the resources of a, at that time, not elite public university, um, cheap space and um, some free time. And Athens really played, I think, the essential role in launching the network of local scenes that would eventually be called alternative and indie culture. Um, in Athens, indie didn't just mean wailing white guys. Uh, it meant gay and queer people. It meant women. And it meant some, even some people of color, although not enough. Um, but ultimately, as a scholar, I'm really interested in the history of possibility. I'm interested in what makes people think in a particular time and place that they can do things, that they can make something that's new and different and better. Um, I think it's really easy to understand why human beings never achieve utopia. But the question that really animates a lot of my research is what makes people try? And that's one of the things I, I think that the story of Athens can tell us. Um, and, and how exactly do, does a place and time, you know, do people come together in a place of time to kind of have that sense that anything might be possible? So for people that were part of the scene, I really wanted to write a story that you would love. Um, that's the thing that terrified me the most, to be honest with you. I'm used to writing for other kinds of audiences. I'm not used to writing for people that, that I know and that and some of you have been friends, some of you are friends, people that I've met even in later years. Um, but I also wanted to write a story that would make you think, that would make you think about race and gender and region most particularly. Uh, but and also just make you think more deeply beyond the music and the fun and the partying, which was all fantastic. Um, for fans of REM and the B-52s, I wanted you to understand more about where these groups come from and how they were shaped by the place they came from and how they shaped that place. And I think that we really don't know the full story of either of those bands um, until we know more about Athens. Um, for, for fans, music fans more broadly, I wanted them to know about bands they might have missed. I'm not going to list them off here because this is a hometown audience and you guys know who the, these bands are. Um, Pylon, Pylon first and foremost among them. Also Mercyland, we've got David Barbie here um, and others. If I start listing them, I'll leave people out. Uh, but I really you know, wanted everybody out there in the world to know about this music. Um, and then just for more general readers who were interested in US culture, I wanted them to understand how at, people in Athens invented new ways of being Southern, of thinking about what it means to be a Southerner, what it means to be a part of Southern culture, or to be a Southern place. Um, I wanted people to know that what happened in Athens was not some kind of unconscious flowering of Southern eccentricity, like some kind of weird knobby gourd that just springs up out of your garden one year, but that it was a conscious creation that people actually thought about what they were doing and they, and they, 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 they looked at what was going on elsewhere. 
um, and that they worked to build the scene. And I wanted people to understand that Athens transformed what it means to create music and art, what it means to be an artist in the late 20th century in a time period um, dominated by co corporate culture, cultural industries. I wanted to under people to understand the role of Athens in that history. That's probably enough for me to say in one big gulp. So I'll just stop there. Thanks, Dave. Grace, thank you. Um, that's terrific. And, and uh, you know, the, one, of, one of the things that, uh, that I love so much about, about your book is that you, you know, it, it, it really does come from the perspective of, of somebody who, who was, who was there, who was in it and, and who loved it. And you go, especially in the later parts of the book, you, you really uh, go into um, fabulous depths um, on, on a lot of bands that, that, uh, you know, just haven't really been written about elsewhere, I don't think. Um, but as you said, one of the, one, one of the great and most important early bands in, in the scene was Pylon. And um, and yes, happily we do have Vanessa Briscoe Hay here from 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 Pylon. So Vanessa, uh, you were you were present at the creation of what we generally think of as the original Athens music scene. Uh, you and other members of Pylon and people in your circle um, were having a lot of fun uh, putting together some legitimately challenging art, including, but not limited to your music. Um, can you tell us what that creative community felt like at that time? I'll try. It's, uh, it's really difficult to put into words, uh, you know, exactly what it was like. But I think at that time, I think about things like uh, Robert Crocker's parties, um, where it was very sweaty and people were dancing and we brought vinyl records and they were uh, spun and there was kegs of beer and we were dancing. Uh, there was a lot of freedom. Uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, Athens had our very own party band, the B-52s. I mean, we had bands before the B-52s in Athens, you know, there was something known as the normal town River of Music. Uh, there were a lot of talented musicians here. And, uh, um, but as far as originality and something that was new that caught the intention of America and then the world, we had the B-52s. And so it was those particular people in the band, uh, you know, they were uh, uh, all except for, I believe Fred um, were, um, locals or had moved here to li live a sort of bohemia lifestyle. I know Fred Schneider was a forestry major uh, as an example. Um, but I things were kind of centered for me around the art department. And at that point in time, we had uh, people that had an awareness about things that were going out, um, out there in the world. Uh, um, we were aware of music and art that was being made in New York and in Europe. Um, you know, we had a core group of people um, that were um, just very supportive of, of the B-52s from the beginning. I didn't see the very first couple of shows. Uh, if the number of people who said they were there were actually there, I don't think any house could have held them. But I know I was, and at the time I didn't have a car. So uh, the first time I saw them formally, um, other than at parties, was at uh, the Last Resort, which is now a fancy restaurant downtown. It was quite good. Um, but it was a, a, a place that had, a, you know, like Sun Ra would play there and uh, Steve Martin. And there was a uh, folk singer uh, who came and played uh, guitar, she kind of traveled through about once a month named Elizabeth, barefoot songstress type. So it was like a coffee house uh, type of thing. And uh, so that was the first place they got to play uh, live. And um, Athens, I think they'd already been to New York once. I'm not quite sure of the timeline. 
but it just blew my mind. And they went to New York and literally like after the first couple of shows that they went there, there are people lining up around the block to get in to see these people. It was completely word of mouth. And it was all, um, it was a breath of fresh air because at that time, um, you know, the uh, punk culture uh, was all about uh, all black and safety pins and, you know, a certain look. And here they came in, they were wearing wild clothes and had wild hair and very colorful and real campy. So it was like a breath of fresh air. And, uh, Around 1978, uh, you know, I graduated in 78, but I hung around town because my first husband, Jimmy Ellison, um, he seemed to make it out of uh, school. Um, a lot of us had jobs, weekend jobs at DuPont, uh, which was a uh, factory out on the outskirts of town um, that was, uh, it was a pretty clean industry. They had a uh, a textile fiber division and so we could work two days a week and then survive the rest of the week on that um so you know i was hanging around going to parties and the b-52s were going you know further and further away and um at that point you know two of my friends uh from art school one of whom i'd met and i uh class taught by Robert Kroger. Um, it was an independent study class. Um, um, he knew it was his last year. So he taught this class the way he always had wanted to teach it. He completely threw it all in. And, uh, you know, he went everywhere with us. We were talking about life and art and, you know, we'd go find the cheap beer, you know, 96 tears really was on the jukebox down at Allen's. Uh, it was about the best cut on there. So anyway, so at, at that point in time, in the fall of 78, um, Randy Bewley and uh, Michael Husky were roommates at the time. Randy was a sculpture major and he said, uh, listen, you know, I'd like to start a band as a uh, uh, art project. And uh, Michael at that time, uh, he was basically, well, it's already all been done. I mean, you know, why would we want to do that? And I think Randy's feelings were as uh, maybe uh, we need another band here to step into this void uh, that's been created. I'm not, you know, sure about the exact words or whatever, but that's just what I feel. Um, so they practice, uh, on some instruments that they bought very cheaply. And uh, at that point in time, uh, they were practicing in Michael's art studio, which was upstairs in the Myers building um, directly above, you know, what is uh, a hamburger place right now, the grill. And uh, Curtis had rented the top two floors of this building and he had the very top floor. He could hear them downstairs and they were just practicing the same thing over and over and over and over. Uh, every now and then they'd come up with a change, you know, because they were teaching themselves to play and um, they were doing it their own way. Um, so, you know, Curtis basically uh, came down and dropped in and said, uh, hey, can I be your drummer? And so at, from that point, it started, you know, snowballing. And then um, in February of 79, they asked me to uh, audition. So uh, they accepted me the next day uh, for whatever reason. I don't think they could hear me, um, but it didn't really matter. They saw I was putting forth good effort and really we were all on the same wavelength as uh, friends and artists. It was kind of a group of maybe uh, 50, 75 people that you could count on to go to a party at that time. And um, so we played uh, three weeks later in um, early March about Chapter 3 Records. Well, Chapter 3 Records was kind of the center of uh, our town as far as music at that point, because that's where you went to find the singles from Germany and the singles from New York, uh, the no wave music, 
even Blondie, you know, a, a lot of this stuff was just too wild um, for a lot of the other more regular type record shops. And it was, luckily it was only located a couple of blocks away from the art school. So you had that factor. And then another factor um, that was coming on is downtown presenting of businesses. So there was a lot of cheap space that was very inexpensive to rent. Um, we had a, um, inexpensive places to uh, practice. Uh, rent was very inexpensive. It wasn't that we were rich by any means, but you could get by and you had time to be creative. <clears throat> and so being young, I was just out of college. Michael was just out of college. Curtis and Randy were, we went to uh, um, play another show. Uh, well, let's see, that first show, I want to talk about about Chapter 3 Records. The band uh, we were opening for was called the Time Tones, and they had a couple of people that you would know now from music. One of them is Dana Downs. She was the bass player, and um, Dick Varney was the guitarist, and uh, David Gamble was the drummer, and David and Vic uh, went on to form the Method Actors, uh, a little bit later in 1980, I think uh, Halloween. So we kind of went into a vacuum. It was like, but it's like we already had a ready-made scene, you know, from the B-52s. And then they, uh, the B-52s heard us, uh, you know, sometime after that show and uh, um, they were very excited and they started dancing and they got us, uh, they helped us get booked in New York and they were major cheerleaders for us. And that's something that we saw again and again in our scene. There were people like the B-52s, Fred Schneider, who were always talking about Athens and talking about, you know, bands from Athens. So later on, REM, uh, they were doing the same thing. We tried to do it too. Um, one thing that I found the scene was very supportive so uh, I think we had that tipping point of the right number of people, but we also had people that had kind of the right attitude about, um, you know, freedom and art and music. So that's what it was like. So Vanessa, yeah. what about going to uh, what about going to New York and going going to other places? Now you you, you all had some very clear ideas of what you were doing you you were you were doing what you were doing on purpose you were you know sophisticated artists you know you were art students um but you were coming out of what was perceived probably by the rest of the country certainly new yorkers uh as more or less a backwater uh, of, of athens georgia um what what did they expect of of, of a, a band from Athens when 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 you played elsewhere, when you played in in bigger cities, uh, and and how did you guys how did you guys sort of manage those those expectations? Was it was there a tension there at all? Was it well, fun? I, it was fun. I think that the uh, there were a couple of things that were going on at that time. Uh, it was, you know, before there was something called post-punk, there was uh, a very healthy art and music scene, which thrived in New York. And a lot of those people, including Keith Haring, you know, he became one of the more famous artists there, were Southerners. So at any given show in um, New York, there would actually be quite a few uh, Southerners there and they would tell people about us. There was also a lot of people going back and forth. I didn't feel quite as exotic uh, in New York, let's say, as I might in Boston or uh, San Francisco or, uh, you know, wherever where, you know, I'd be standing at the bar and people would just ask me to say things and uh, <laughs> I would just be, you know, beer, you know, <laughs> you 
you know, what do you want me to say? And uh, I I've, I've kind of have a twangy accent. I don't have like a typical Southern accent. So they were kind of fascinated with that because what they knew was like, uh, you know, Dallas or, uh, you know, TV shows like that. And uh, I think we helped tear down some uh, misconceptions about wh who and what Southerners were and were capable of. I mean, we have, uh, you're right, we had a very clear idea of what we wanted to do. I mean, uh, Michael Husky and our band is super, super bright and intelligent. Uh, and he had made pretty much a manifesto uh, when we started. Uh, uh, he wrote a letter to Robert Croker, which got unsealed like 38 years later at a party and read it and it just like, which is all along. <laughs> yeah, we could have like, well, the whole point was, it's just like any art that you make, you know, like when you have an art project, you have a idea of what the project is and it has a focus and a conclusion, whether it's going to be a show or, uh, you know, the piece is going to be finalized, but, you know, art can also be finished with the first broad stroke of the brush. So uh, beginning and finishing things are very important. So we agreed that, uh, you know, we're gonna go to New York, we're gonna play once, get written up in New York Rocker and that's gonna be it. We were totally fine with that. I mean, it's a lot of effort to put into a project. You know what, most art projects do require quite a bit of time and people just don't see it. They see, you know, whatever, and they don't realize, you know, that's $400 right there. So, it, you know, we didn't think anything about that. But then uh, it's, we got press and interview magazine, and uh, we got more attention, and we got, you know, some really fun bookings. Uh, we just decided to keep doing it as long as it was fun. So, uh, I mean, we, had, we did have a clear idea. Um, about what we were doing, and uh, yeah. we were very uh, organized about it too. Well, and you kept doing it, and you and you you built something, uh, and and that's a and the, that I think is a good place to uh, to move to to David Barbie, um, who 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 came into uh, came into Athens. Right around the time that Pylon uh, had finished its first existence, uh, David, you you came you came when in eighty five? Is that right? I, one of the best things I've heard all night is that you think I'm four years younger than I actually am. I'm <laughs> here in eighty one. So did you really, where, where did I get 85? I'm so sorry. That's when Murphy Land started. I okay. Have, okay, there we go. I've been I, here 81. I was standing um, on the wall of a club dressed no more fashionably than I am right now, um, holding a can of cheap beer and watching Vanessa and others blow my mind. So, so can you tell us a little bit about the state of music in Athens around around the time you arrived and how you and, and as you gradually sort of made your place in in the in whatever Athens music was and, and became? Oh, man, I can remember it so well, because um, it was an established scene by the time I got here in 81. And to put this in perspective, uh, Danny Beard, the great guy who released all these cool records that came out of here at that time on DB Records. Um, you know, about in maybe the early 2000s or something, Danny asked me, when did you move to Athens? And I said, 81, which seems like a long time ago. But I told him I moved here in 1981. He said, oh, you almost made it, didn't you? <laughs> that's kind of how I felt when I got here. I'm, I was aware I was part of what the group of people that, were in bands that were kind of referred to at the time as the second wave. Uh, the Kilkenny Cats and Fashion Battery, bands like that, that were people who were about my, came to came out at the same time I did. And so um, I had, um, you know, I'd heard 
of course I knew about the B-52s in high school. And then I heard the REM single, which came out, I think in 81, maybe right before I moved up here to start college. And, um, but I didn't know about all this other stuff that was going on. And um, I would see these like cool looking people walking across the, the Reed quadrangle and I never knew where they were going. And I saw a picture of, um, uh, yeah, I saw an ad or a picture in the red and black or something of a band playing at the 40 watt, which is where the sadly recently moved out of Caledonia is. And um, I can't remember if I was there first or I saw REM play someplace a little bigger first, but whatever, it's kind of mixing up a bit. But I know that the first time I walked into the tiny little 40 watt down there and it was jammed full of people, just like, as Vanessa described, sweating and dancing and drinking cheap beer and having a good time, that first off, I realized, okay, this is where the cool looking people go. And secondly, this is my tribe. Like the, I've never been around a group of people that I thought, man, this is it, man. This is, this, I, I, I feel this so deeply. And so I wanted to be part of it so badly. Um, but I was J school, not art school. And the original scene very much derived from the art school. And so I didn't know very many people. And I was really, really, um, it's funny now because I've been part of this so long, but I was actually very intimidated by it at first and I would go to shows and stand there and check it all out and take it in and didn't really like talk to too many people and there were three people that were my icebreakers and I am now going to publicly acknowledge and thank them for it one of them uh is um Brian Cook of Is Ot Gap who I think I saw on this call a little while ago who just seemed like an extremely approachable guy and he uh was <laughs> And was great to me right away. Um, Peter Buck, who was in a band, I can't remember what they were called. And um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, Linda Hopper of oh, OK, who was just like the nicest person on earth to me, like from the very beginning. And kind of when and when I go to a part late night party and it's just like, uh, I don't know, no, nobody knows me and my button in or something. She's somebody that would always like come over and say hi to me and hang out with me and make me and kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of helps you be a little bit, you know, like a in doc, you know, let people know you're okay. You're hanging out with like somebody that we know. And I just gradually got to know people. But once I did, um, it was great because as Vanessa pointed out, it was very open and supportive and my pre mercy land bands, which were all so terrible so terrible that by the time I was in my early 20s I put all the tapes in a box and covered it with duct tape and the reason I did to keep would be to keep myself from erasing them because I knew that when I was like an old man I'd want to go back and hear what they sounded like but um and I still haven't done that yet um but it what it was like was incredibly exciting because Pylon and Love Tractor I mean, R.E.M. is already by this point like a touring club sensation around the country. And Pylon and Love Tractor, R.E.M. is like these bands uh, seemed like stars to me. And um, then to realize like, oh, man, I can get in here. These cool bands in town are letting my bands open up for them and play shows and play parties. And it was a really wildly exciting thing to be part of because it already was going and I guess there's maybe 15 or 20 bands here or something at the time uh Vanessa just yes or no does that seem about right maybe early 80s yeah that sounds about right you know and, and then after uh Athens Georgia Inside Out it exploded yeah yeah but I'd say 15 20 that sounds and it was just cool that there was um it was so DIY it was so supportive it was um also, it seemed like the only cardinal sin was to rip off somebody else. That basically it was like, do your thing, be yourself. And so the concept of the Athens sound was always a funny thing to me because people would say, oh, it's got that Athens sound. And it's like, no, the Athens sound is not bands that moved to Athens to imitate REM. The Athens sound is being yourself. And that to me was like a totally liberating thing in the world. And it was also like, the punk rock that I loved as a teenager, but not all like leather jackets and black and me having to be a lot tougher than I really am. So uh, David, before you were 
the guy with the truly amazing uh, tricked out recording studio uh, at the time I met you, you were the guy who would record everybody's friend's band in the storage bin up on Broad Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine that you were finding other places to record uh, people's bands and their friends' bands uh, be before that. How did, how did you become that guy? I always wanted to record music. I always wanted to be engineer producer. I was, um, I made the, the first time I recorded my own band and, and made copies and sold them was when I was 12 years old and sold my cassettes at school that I recorded in my basement on a quarter inch tape machine that is one of the like million tape machines that I have been shoved around this building in various places. And um, then I got a four track cassette recorder and because of my vast uh blissful ignorance and part of being the super supportive scene that's like do your own thing i just believed that i was a record producer and um i also knew that you get good at something by doing it you want to be in a band get in a van and go somewhere you want to be in a band be like pylon just start playing you want to you always hear these stories about uh the basketball great larry bird like shooting hoops at a iron hoop on a barn and it's uh yeah just do it so i recorded all kinds of bands on my four track cassette i recorded your band I, well, at least a couple of your bands along the way when you lived over on easy street um and uh i just recorded everybody and like the ones that really really gave me my cred were the barbecue killers and um i, I made all these recordings nobody's ever heard on my four track of them way we ever went to a studio together and then i started going into a stu to studios with bands and i did this because i love doing it more than anything and I, I still do but i did go all over the place i would go to studios i would go to your practice space i would go to my practice space and i cannot overstate like the need of being surprised as a relatively young man with a baby and a baby and a baby and at that point it's either i was working at the taco stand i was hanging Siding. I put myself in the shopping center parking lots and uh, bag them up and wherever they at. Uh, I walked in here. Uh oh. Oh, we got the classic uh, unmuted Zoom. So, yeah, I'd record yeah. everybody, uh, everybody who might be uh, accidentally uh, unmuted, if, if you can please go ahead and mute yourself uh because whenever uh whenever you make a noise you pop up on the screen <laughs> thank you so yeah i basically i recorded anybody that i thought was cool and anybody that would let me do it and just did it over and over and over and over and over again and there you go um so this is this is kind of uh, skipping ahead, but we got 40 years to cover in what an hour. Um, what do you see? You've been you, you've been engaged with with music here like it, consistently and and avidly for for longer than than any of the rest of us, at least in an unbroken way. Um, aside from you know the obvious stuff, the internet digital technology stuff that's affected everything about the way that we live what are to you what do you what are the what are the biggest developments in the athens music scene over between the time that you arrived and now dave it's it's so hard for me to try and determine any one thing because it's just it is an evolution that has gradually shifted. It's like what people perceived as the original art school group. And then by like the mid eighties, when I was playing in Mercyland and there's the barbecue killers and Porn Orchard and Eat America, there's all these like punk rock and post-punk influenced bands. But we grew on the inspiration from the group that was ahead of us. And then in about in the early nineties, there were um, 
SCADs, it seemed, or in the early 90s, it seemed like there was all these like math heavy bands kind of derived around Harvey Milk and the Jacko Nuts and Slumberjack. I got, it seems like I recorded bands like that every day of my life for about four years and I loved it. And then it kind of morphed into where by the mid 90s, there's tons of Americana bands and there's your great band, the Starroom Boys and the Drive By Truckers. And the idea of bands that draw from influences um, that cover um, uh, Merle Haggard and like the mid 70s Neil Young Ditch Trilogy era, uh, which to me is like one of the truckers greater influences is uh, coming out of this thing that started in the with like post punk in the art school that uh, related more to the gang of four is a pretty wild progression it just took but we're like 20 years along right there um what i've seen in the last um you know 10 years or so has been the greater uh, diversity in the scene greater inclusion more hip-hop getting more greater presence in the scene and um the uh in more kind of like chill wave pop bands with there's just like it just is constantly changing and i've just realized i've totally glossed over like Elephant Six, which had this completely wild, different impact. Yeah. Who else I've totally left out that is globally, massively important is widespread panic in the jam band scene. I mean, these are, you, we could have a Zoom about any one of these spurs of the scene, and so much of it gets back to Pylon and Love Tractor and the Bees and REM and the side effects and these early bands. And there's somebody that Vanessa mentioned briefly that I want to point out that I think sometimes I think of this guy as the like the I mean he's like Neil Armstrong he's in some way the guy that embodies the spirit that kind of start lit the spark and keeps it going yeah. that Curtis is like the most hands-on can-do guy positive the spirit and um an amazing drummer uh and I'm sure that Vanessa feels about Curtis like I do that I uh, see so a smile that it's like it's um, the spirit has remained of individualism and DIY. Um, and I can't identify any single thing except it just keeps on growing and changing was which is what to me like anything to do with art and expression should do. Um I could go on for about five hours, but I'm going to stop because there's a lot. <laughs> David, that's that's totally great. Um, thank you so much. And Grace, uh, you you had a question uh, for Montu, who, unlike uh, Vanessa and David, you had never met before tonight. Um, do you want to do you want to step in and and uh, and ask Montu a question? Uh, especially since since David has brought us up to the present here. Yeah, uh, in that whirlwind tour, that was fantastic. Um, I'd love to. Um, I know all that I know about hip hop in Athens. I know from Derek Aldridge, who's on this call, I think, on this this program. Um, and I know that he knows Montu, but I but I I don't know enough. And so I I wondered if Montu, you might speak to. Um, how this um, talk about how the um, things are working to create a kind of sense of possibility in the hip hop community that you're a part of in that part of the Athens scene. Um, who are the key figures and the key venues that come together to produce um, that kind of outpouring of creativity that, that I think some of us here aren't familiar enough with. I wondered if you might just give us that, that story. Sure. Um, so first I want to talk about, so I came in 99 and it's funny because every time people meet me, it's, it's as if hip hop wasn't here before I was here, but it was, you know, um, they were just, they just had to do more talent shows and kind of garage shows and house parties and whatnot, because there was low down and dirty. There was Bruce Chambers. There was Amun Ra. So there was like this whole really underground scene that existed that nobody even knew existed so i come in 99 and you know i meet a lot of these key characters um 
came here, University of Georgia brought me here. Um, and I just met a lot of these key characters. And the one thing that I really um, appreciated about Athens is like how, how welcoming it was. You know, I didn't come in, you know, even to be completely honest, I didn't come in even wanting to, uh, to do the things that I did, but I just saw a need for it. So um, we just started doing stuff at my house. Um, we called it the lounge. It's at River's Edge Apartment. Apartment 136, Rivers Edge, um, still there now, but, um, and we just started doing stuff in my house. We would do poetry ciphers on Wednesday. Um, we do Thursday night, or no, excuse me, Thursday we do poetry ciphers. On Fridays we would do ciphers with like hip hop MCs. So like we created this, this, uh, this place that just had like, you know, local Athenians, uh, UGA students, um, you know, it was just like this, you know, pro-black uh, individuals, these bohemian individuals, like it just like, it, we created this like this environment that just like was just so welcoming and just kind of just to be yourself. But it grew to the point where, I mean, on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'd end up having like 200 people at my house. So it got to the point where we just didn't have the space. So I started looking, looking, looking. Um, and to be completely honest with you, there was really nowhere for us to go. But so we started doing campus shows, you know, um, Georgia Hall, which I don't think exists anymore. We did some stuff there. We uh, we rented out the PJ. So what we did is we ended up getting a, um, a student organization on campus called the Dreaded Minds Family. So we just we all you know, we only needed 10 people to sign up. So we got I got 10 students, probably only two of us was even actually in the group. But, you know, we, and, and we just, we we'd go to the PJs where, you know, during the day it was like, you know, university professors would be teaching there at night. I'd have like hip hop cyphers up in there, you know? So we do that and we got to the point where eh, that was cool, but we really want to go downtown. So somehow, and I honestly don't know how it happened. Um, I met up with uh, Murphy Wolford, man. And I'll tell you what, I just remembered how it happened. Amun Ra had a show at Tasty World and that night I met Murphy. And when I, after I met Murphy, Murphy was like, you know, this old punk rock dude and you know, punk rock and hip hop always kind of work well together. Like we're like cousins. So he was like, man, you can do whatever you want in here. So that was like, he gave me the upstairs on like, I think we started on Tuesday nights or something. He gave me the upstairs and we just started rocking. Like we started doing cyphers up there beat battles, uh, we just started doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, that, back then you're talking about, you know, um, Earth Collective, you're talking about issues, um, Russia, uh, that, that whole Attica sound with Hano and Yoroma, like, you know, it was just like this, this ball of energy that was happening and we just going. On top of that, we would also have like the trap stars. You know, we would have some, we would have some of the local guys that, you know, they, they were they were rapping they were rapping about where they came from so it was like you had that was that's the beautiful part that's why it's funny that i heard i hear barbie talk about how people say well what is the acting scene i mean what is that because people ask me that too like what is the acting sound the acting sound is there is no acting sound the acting sound is to be yourself so it's like we have like this diverse you know buffet table of just hip-hop that just kept coming and coming and coming and you know, we we rented out Hurdy Field one year and did a festival. Like we were just like DIY DIY as it got. Like we were just doing wherever we could play, we were playing. You know, we were just going, going, going. So Tasty World. But I think after we started, um, I think after we started showing other venues that you know hip hop was nothing to fear downtown. You know, like we weren't we, we weren't we weren't going to come to your spot and like shoot it up. You know, because I think that really was a perception while a lot of places just didn't allow us to do our thing. But Murphy gave us a chance and we just banged Tasty World out. Next thing you know, somehow we're in Caledonia. You know, next thing you know, you know, there's a 40 watt show every now and then, you know, there's these other shows here and there. So like, we just kind of had to climb this uphill battle. Like this whole, whole time I've been in Athens, it's 20 years I've been in Athens. Like we, I would say just recently, probably in the last four or five years actually are getting the recognition that we deserve. Cause I mean, we, we, at least down, at least downtown, I can't speak before I was here, but at least downtown, I mean, we've been doing this thing since 2000 in, in Athens, you know, and we just never got the credit, you know, flagpole wasn't covering us, red and black wasn't covering us. And, you know, for a while we was just, we was kind of mad at the music scene. Cause it was like, you know, y'all claim to be this, 
music town, but you're really just an indie rock town. Like, so I used to say that all the time. I used to say it all the time. I say, y'all need to stop saying y'all are a music town because you're not, you're an indie rock town. Like this is any rock dominated town. Like y'all don't want nothing else. Like, you know, I'd invite people out to the shows. They wouldn't come and I would go to their indie rock shows. Like we was trying to build bridges. Nobody wanted to hear it. And I understand it's new. You know, it was, it was back when hip hop wasn't like the thing that it is now. So I get it, you know, but we had to, we had to crawl and fight just to get in the position that we're in today that, which is really is a beautiful position, but we, we literally had to fight our way into this Athens, uh, this Athens music town. Like we had to fight our way. We had to claw, fight, you know, like, and if, and to be honest with you, I don't know, maybe it would eventually happen, but if it wasn't for Murphy, you know, I, even to this day, like me and Murphy, we'll, we'll have send some messages on Facebook every now and then. Like, yep. I'll just, I'll just think about them sometimes to just like send them a thank you. Like, if it wasn't for Murphy, I don't know if hip hop would have ever even got a chance in, um, in Athens. I don't know. You know. Yeah, that is wonderful to hear. I, I worked for Murphy at Tasty World. Murphy's one of my oldest friends. Um, and you know, Montu, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about breaking down barriers. You're talking, uh, and and this is something that Grace talks about in her book is the is the whiteness of the scene and 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 just sort of the the lack of diversity there um and and the, you're and you're talking about coming into it recognizing it and 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 just pushing against it and and making some stuff happen um so you've you've seen a lot of barriers come down i'm wondering what what's still up? What are, what are the barriers that still need to come down? What, what, what still separates black music and white music in Athens? Well, uh, as they say, BC, like before COVID, um, right. I just feel like we never really got like, even though we'd have some 40 watt shows and, you know, uh, we'd open up a few times at Georgia theater. I feel like we never really got, um, our chance to like really, show what we could do there you know like i really i, I feel like there's i feel like there's these spots and, and and maybe this is just with everybody in the music scene i don't know but i'm just speaking from experience there's like these places in athens that i feel like we're slowly getting into but like like to be to be completely honest with you a couple of years ago this panel would have happened without hip-hop you know right. just to be completely honest like there, there's these type of panels that I would see happen, I would go to them and like, we would be rocking and no one asked anyone from the hip hop community to even come, you know? So it's, it, the barriers are, are still there slightly, but I would say we're knocking them down. And it's because we just, we just fought our way there, man. So I would say, I'm not gonna see there's not, I'm not gonna say there's not any barriers left cause there is, but right now we're, um, hip hop is winning in Athens, man. Like we're winning, like we're doing some, we're doing some things like there's some people that's doing some really really live things in Athens hip hop and you know Athens hip hop is winning like we 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 had to persevere we had to you know overcome but like right now we winning so um that's kind of a hard question because you know once once covid you know is over and whatever like we'll let we'll see yeah. if we'll see if uh you know Georgia Theater wants to do some shows with us 40 Wild wants to do some shows with us and whatever venues get past all this we'll see you know because that's one thing about hip-hop we never beg to do no shows man because you know what if we if we can't do shows downtown we'll just go somewhere else we'll just we'll we'll, we'll, we'll find a space like we'll, we'll we'll find somebody's house we can rock until they give us a noise violation you know what i mean so yeah just just like the old scene right yeah yeah so i mean so, there's, there's some beautiful things happening man well let's um Th thanks, Montu. Um, Thank you. Let's have a let's let's open up the the discussion a little bit. Grace, you you had a had a few things that you wanted to bring to the to the whole panel, I think. Um, and we've you know we've gone a little long in this in this first segment, and we do want to get to some uh, some audience questions here. I see that we we we've, we've already got a, a, a one comment in, but. Um, let's have let's take just a few minutes to 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 talk uh to let the the panel respond to to a couple of things that you wanted to ask about well 
I, I guess um, I'll just ask this one thing, and then I think maybe Q and A would be good. Um, that sounds correct. Lots of folks out there. Um, you know, one of the things I think that's so interesting about hearing Montu talk about the the rise of not the rise, because as he said, the hip hip hop was going before he came, but the story of hip hop that he, as he was a part of it from the late nineties forward and the overlapping parallels with the, the earlier time period of the seventies and eighties and the scene that, that I was talking about and that Vanessa and David were a part of. Um, I, I think it's interesting how participating in any way as a fan, as a musician, as somebody who's organizing shows or um, running a small business like a recording studio, how that kind of participation um, really transforms people's lives, it seems to me. Um, so not only this great music gets produced, but also people end up on different life trajectories than they might have been on otherwise. And I just wondered if, if maybe all of you folks could speak to that. Uh, maybe we could just go in the reverse order um, and hear from Montu first since since we went that, you know, we, we started with the others. Um, sure. But I just think it would be interesting to hear what you guys have to say about that. So I never really wanted to do this thing, but, you know, and I started at UGA in 99 and I just graduated this last summer. So well, one thing that, thank you. One thing that changed for me was like, it completely just threw me off, off my whole trajectory. You know, going, I went on tour with Issue. We went out, we went out California. I was, I just dropped everything. Like, I was like, okay, I guess I'm not registering next semester because I'm on tour. Next thing you know, I got kids coming. Next thing you know, I buy a house. Next thing you know, this. So it's like, it's, but the whole time I'm still doing music. So I guess to answer your question, like, I mean, music took me on this like roller coaster ride that just like, wow. Like, I mean, just to say, like, honestly, it's funny that this is happening now because I literally just graduated this summer and I was supposed to graduate like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you know, feeling, but I, it happened. <laughs> Do others want to speak to that? Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, for me, I think about the fact that, you know, there's so many times in the past especially about the past 30 years that um, when I was playing in Sugar, I kept thinking, it was, and yeah, going back further than that, even when I was in Mercyland, I would think maybe I should move to New York. You know, like there's, I, I mean, I was already making so many records. And um, then at various times, it's like, maybe I should move to LA. You know, it's like there, I could, I know so many people, there's so much out there. Uh, maybe I could move, maybe I should move to Nashville, um, not so much for country music, but just because it was such an intersection of the music business. But every time I would come back to a few things, which is, uh, you know, early on in the mid nineties, I realized sooner or later, the road to the airport is going to get better and all the computers in the world will be able to talk to each other. Um, and I just love living here. I love the vibe of the town. I love the creative energy. I love the um, fact that it's true in indie rock and it's true in hip hop. And Monta, you're right, we were an indie rock town. And, uh, but we have, it's become, it's a thing where you're free to do your thing. It's a great place for me to raise my children. Um, and, but the point of all this is this, there is no other city this size in the United States of America, where I could have built a lengthy career making records in my studio, it doesn't exist. I mean, I would have had to go to Nashville, New York, or LA to really, because there's studios in every big city in America, but I'll tell you, I know the studio business and they keep themselves busy with, you know, other maybe voiceovers or, you know, books on tape or whatever. It's all cool stuff. But like my thing is I want to make records. That's what I like to do. This is the only city this size in the country, maybe in the world, that I could have gotten away with this as long as I have. And that is how I feel about it. I feel like I've gotten away with something by being able to do this. And the town and the people that are here are what makes it able to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. So I'm next. Oh, well, you know, I, I was on the trajectory uh, that I would probably have moved to a bigger city uh, because with an art degree, there's not a whole lot that you could have done at that time. 
1978, I mean, I, I was going around applying for jobs and people would say, why are you still here? You know, that see, I had a degree. Because at that point, people were expected to leave town once you got your degree from UGA. Um, but I, I stayed and uh, I'm glad I stayed. Um, I, I probably uh, would have had some, some job in the arts. I'm not sure what. Um, at one point, uh, I applied for a job for Saks Fifth Avenue in Atlanta to do windows. Um, you know, just something to help fund, you know, the art that I would make. I don't know where I would have been. I mean, you know, like I joked with Curtis once, it's impossible to predict the past. And it really is. Uh, my, my trajectory has gone all over the place. I've uh, Pylon reformed three times. Uh, I uh, worked as a manager for a copy store. Um, when Pylon broke up the second time, uh, I took that as an opportunity to become um, a nurse. And I was a registered nurse for 21 years. Um, toward the end of that time, my girls were older. I had a family. Um, I, I uh, started a recording project called Supercluster, and it was about the time that Pylon reformed. I think it was kind of an answer to um, Curtis is not in town. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, he, his job called him away. So, uh, you know, Randy and I started uh, with Supercluster, and we kind of um, Hannah Jones, the drummer, and Kay Stanton, and John Fernandez, and Bob Hay, my husband, and um, Bill David, yeah. Amanda Lynn, and we had a great time. Um, and then, uh, you know, when Randy died, that was something that was unexpected. I mean, I had, you know, suddenly I was just uh, in mourning like everybody else. But we had two records to finish up, one of which was a reissue for Pylon uh, Chomp. And the other is we had three songs left to record for uh, Supercluster. So those both came out in October. And then that kind of faded away, all of that. And I was just working and taking care of my mom and uh, my kids and stuff. It's just life, you know. Um, I've enjoyed every bit of, bit of it, but. I haven't tried to like uh, count on anything. Uh, we all go through things. We all have loss. Uh, we all have expectations. Uh, I've found it's best to not to have too many expectations and to be very happy with whatever I have to do. And so uh, my my focus for like the last bunch of years here is to get all the pylon stuff back in our domain uh, and do reissues. And so that just came out. So I've been, you know, working so hard on this for a while, even though I'm a retired nurse now. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I have no idea. Hopefully, uh, Palo Alto Reenactment Society do something. But anyway, thanks for the question. <laughs> I could tell yeah. you want me to wrap up. Just go like this and just be, be quiet. You're talking too much, you know. So, anyway. Never, never Vanessa. <laughs> but uh, y'all, thank you. Thank, thank, thanks to everybody for addressing that. And uh, let's um, let's move along to to some of the some of the questions that we're getting from from uh, from folks watching. Uh, we we had a comment earlier in response to in response to Montu from uh, from Teron Watkins that the the school and town are too separated. That that was in response to uh, something that you were saying about the set just sort of the barriers in, in the town, and that that's certainly always been true to a to a certain extent, and and I I say remains a a barrier that. That needs to be addressed, and hopefully, hopefully that will be at some point. But as for questions, um, there are two questions: one from uh, one from Derek Allridge, and and one from uh, from Scott Alexander. Derek uh, asks to what extent were artists in Athens involved in social activism, 
And Scott asks, did hip hop musicians in Athens get involved with civil rights issues? If so, what type of campaigns did they get involved in? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll open, I'll just combine those two questions and let, and, and maybe ask Grace to address the, the first one, uh, which I, I think is, is more, more a question about, uh, about the, the, the time that you're addressing in your book. And here's Harry, say hello. And then we'll, we'll let Montu answer the second. Okay, um, you know, I, I think the social act, there, there always are some activists involved in the scene and there's an overlap in, in the early days between um, sort of, uh, you know, what, what had been called the hippie, you know, the hippie crowd, um, many of whom were very um, committed to organizing around peace, um, uh, coming out of the Vietnam War movement into the kind of anti-nuclear movement. Um, those folks were around the Human Rights Festival was um, uh, some, a place where many of those activists uh, came together with um, other kinds of musicians, jam bands and in, indie bands coming together. Um, so those folks were always around, but I think um, what in terms of the sort of currents of, of the indie alternative scene, um, you saw kind of growing activism um, really beginning in the mid 80s um, around environmentalism and also historic preservation issues, which, which were kind of in local, which were in a sort, certain sense, local environmental issues. Um, uh, we were constantly fighting the hospital and Prince Avenue Baptist Church and, and other sort of institutions uh, that were tearing down um, historic structures in town. Uh, so, so that kind of activism really, um, really exploded, exploded by the late 80s. Um, and you saw it kind of coalesce around the, the, uh, the fight over whether to unify the county and the city. Um, and then that became a way, interestingly, uh, it, because of the way things were happening in that moment, voting for that reunification began a way to choose a whole new slate of people to run the area. And so folks got involved, um, uh, long-term civil rights activists from the black community coming together with some of these peace and anti-nuke activists that had been around before with the kind of younger indie alternative music folks that were interested in environmentalism and historic preservation, all coming together um, to vote for reunification and then support Gwen O'Looney's candidacy um, was really a kind of a, a interesting moment. And I know that that coalition um, uh, has in some ways continued it has its ups and downs, it's sort of current versions of this. There are always tensions between those groups, but, um, but that for me, at least in the history that I know, is that late, late 80s, early 90s moment when, the, when that coalition is really solidified. And the moment when the, when the Prince Avenue Baptist Church crowd learned that some of those really scruffy downtown kids had money. So when REM, when the REM folks and Burtis Downs, you know, were able to pony up what seemed like a fortune to us at the time, it was probably only like a thousand dollars a piece, but it might as well have been a million um, and uh, support Gwen O'Looney's campaign. And some of you are, that are on this call remember the t-shirts that Gwen O'Looney made that said another black feminist hippie. Um, what was the other thing? There was a, 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 maybe it was gay, you know, person for that loony woman that one of her um, opponents had said about her uh, to a reporter um, and she turned them into t-shirts. And so that was, that was a real interesting moment. Uh, and it seems to me that the town uh, really shifted at that moment away from the kind of conservative old Athens folks that had always run everything. Um, but others can speak to the time after that, but uh, that is the time period up through the early 90s. At some point, you though, you guys must have lost control of things because the development that's happened in Athens, mm. I can't imagine that the historic preservation folks would have supported that. So I don't know when that happened, what, late 90s maybe? But maybe Montu can talk about that and other aspects of activism in hip hop. Yeah, Montu, what about civil rights and, and hip hop? Uh, Eugene, Eugene Willis has, has answered well, the question, but I, well, I, I, you I know, think I know the answer as well. Can you talk hip, about it? Hip hop's always kind of been involved in, in, in civil rights issues and, you know, being just pushing black issues and just really trying to make our, it's sort of like the um, hip hop had to fight its way in Athens. We've had to fight our way just in general across the board. 
you know, like when I was here, when I was at the University of Georgia, uh, Dr. Aldrich, we had this, uh, this group we put together because there was only 1.9% black male at um, University of Georgia at the time. So we created this whole movement, um, did a silent sit-in at President Adams' uh, office. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Aldridge had us at his house. Like, it, he, I mean, it, it was just, it was mind blowing because like everything I was like studying and talking about, you know, like studying about the Panthers and, you know, all these, these, the civil rights movement. And like, I felt like we were literally going through it with like, you know, Dr. Aldridge would have us in there and he'd bring people through to speak and we, we, we'd, be, we'd have the big boards out talking about it. So I think I have, and at least my circle and like a lot of, the, we've always kind of been involved with people's political campaigns and, um, you know, just really fighting, fighting for the right to just, just to be a human being sometimes. So I think hip hop's always fought that battle and we're continuing to fight that battle. Um, and that's, you know, even we got, I mean, we got, we got a hip hopper on the commission right now with Mariah, but you know, we got all kinds of teachers that are hip hoppers now that I grew, that grew up in our scene. We got lawyers and doctors. So it's like, we're, it, it's, it's, it's us just fighting our way through this whole thing. Not just like, cause when I said it earlier, I mean, I said it in the sense of like the music, but it, it's, it was more than the music, like fighting that fight downtown wasn't just about us um, uh, playing in those clubs. It was about us getting respect downtown. It was about us even being able to come downtown and feel welcome. So it's like, don't get confused and think I'm just talking about hip hop music. I'm talking about just black people in general being happy to fight in this town tooth and nail, like since, since it was even founded, you know, like we, you know, black people built this, this city, you know, built the University of Georgia, but like, and, and since there's, there's a lot of like respect, we just, we, we've had to fight to get, even though we built it. Yeah. So we've always been here and we're going to continue to be here. We're going to keep doing it. And anybody who wants to unite with any of the hip hop that's going in town, just real quick, because I know we're probably going to wrap up. Like I'm not hard to get in touch with the hip hoppers not hard to get in touch with. And we doing music stuff. We doing activism. We doing all kinds of great things. So, you know, What's a what's a website folks can go to? Um, how about I just throw my um my email down here because we the website thing we we don't, it went out on on that, but I just throw my email on here real quick. All right. Hey Dave, I'd like to comment a little bit on the social activism of artists in Athens too, if that's cool. I think that sounds great. I think that there is. I think there has been a lot of this over the years, and um. I remember what Beth's talking about. Sorry, that's what we used to call her when we were in college. I'd slipped up. Grace or Beth, I'm still going to call you. You'll answer to both, I know. Uh, term of endearment. Uh, yeah, I remember the Gwen O'Looney race well. I remember one of her opponents pointing out that her husband was, I love this, a card-carrying member of the ACLU. Now, we're not really sure what that means in Athens. And was just like, okay, I volunteered for her campaign the next day. Um, and <laughs> of our local hip hop community of artists that come into the studio of people I see performing through the students are just like, and, you know, especially through Mariah's presence, hell yeah, they're doing a great thing. But I also see this with a lot of our rock bands too. Um, drive by truckers, five, uh, Southern white guys in their forties and fifties. Um, shortly after the Michael Brown shooting had a black lives matter sign on their stage and um, spoke about this stuff from their stages, and it cost them fans at first. Their crowd, of fans. First. yeah, it did. Now the, there's a happy ending to this. They have since made three highly politically charged albums um, that um, have been extremely outspoken on political and social issues. And obviously making their records, you know, I'm closer to this situation and, and maybe I'm more aware of it, but um, they've gotten more credit for this like around the world, I think, than in Athens. But it's interesting that um, their crowd now is much bigger than it was, but it is younger, it is more diverse, there's more women in this crowd. Basically, they kind of told their audience, this is how we feel. And if you don't like it, we don't need your money. You can get out. And it's, and they didn't suffer for this at all. They actually only benefited from it, which is something I hope that is, I mean, it, it, it resonated and it's cool to see. 
I see other artists doing this too, more in the last few years, but um, they've had two like top 10 albums as a result of saying, hey, we're not just a Southern rock band. Like we feel this deeply. And um, yeah, I think they, I think they, they are doing a cool thing. And I mean, obviously I know them and that's my thing, but yeah, they deserve their props. It's not me. I, you know, push, push the knobs. I mean, I believe it and I'm with them 100%, but I'm saying they deserve the credit. Yeah, it's a nice reminder that uh, that that a lot of times there's not as steep a price to pay as people fear there will be for uh, for 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 taking a stand for for being who you who who you believe you you are supposed to be and 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 for doing doing what's right. Um, I know I said that I was going to try to uh, to like unmute people and have them ask ask questions face to face. That's all out the window. I'm not. I'm not doing that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, everybody. That was a that was a, a lovely idea. But we've we've got time for at least one more question. And Grace Garrett had one uh, a, a a couple back on the on the uh, on the scroll here, and and she asks, um, how do we preserve what makes the Athens scene so special, especially when it seems external factors, the school commercialization, gentrification, threaten it. Additionally, how do we expand this to include all folks in the scene? It's what we're talking about already, right? It's unity. Yeah. I mean, it's taking that it's taking that ball of energy. It's taking that you know all the, all these different things that's happening from social activism to just like great music to education, and it's like putting it all together. And we have to we 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 can't just talk about it. I say all the time like. We can build a bridge, but if you never use the bridge, it doesn't make any sense to even have the bridge. So not only do we need to build the bridge, we need to actually use it. So, you know, we need to do some cross-pollinating when it comes to music, do some cross-pollinating when it comes to um, education and and, and, and um, pulling as we climb. So, um, yeah, it, it, the only way it's going to last through all this all this corporate stuff that's happening is if, if we, if, it's only going to, it's, it, if we let it happen, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna put it that way. If, if, if we look up in Athens, looks like a little in Atlanta, that means we let it happen. Cause all these people on this call, all the people that are here, like if we let it happen, then it's, it's on us. So we have to we have to unify and like really have like a united front and, and, and be real about it and, and put our boots on the ground and, and, and be honest, have these honest, hard conversations. Like this conversation we're having, we could have this for the next five hours and it would be we probably wouldn't lose any callers so because it's 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 that real right now like it's it's real right now so we have to like we have to unify i mean it, it seems simple and pie in the sky but like we got to really like connect the dots and build these bridges and use them what do the rest of y'all think i just want to say to montu um thank you for that comment and i think if the last week or so hasn't hasn't shown not just people that are in this this forum but across the country that Montu speaks, what he says is, is absolutely true. Uh, you know, there can be no more delay. The bridge has to be built and used. Thank you for that. And I'm an amen with Montu on us as individuals, you know, unity, but also us take making the moves ourselves. It's like when you look at downtown Athens, I mean, it is, um, it is a problem. I mean, for, it's like the, I mean, I say this kind of half jokingly that I've always regarded myself as like a West downtown hipster, because of course on the other end of downtown, you cross Lumpkin and it's like, like the Disneyland of get wasted. And <laughs> it's, um, and the COVID has been such a gut punch for people and um, the loss of two vital um, independent businesses downtown, the Caledonia and Atomic in the past week is just a real, it's a serious loss, but it's also a wake up call that we don't wanna lose this cool, unique culture. Um, there are some things that are gonna be very difficult for us to take on, I think, as a town, which is rising real estate costs, that the influx in the past, the, the music scene has been fueled by the influx of smart young people who moved to Athens, you know, a lot of them to attend UGA like many of us did, and cheap real estate, 
keep rent and that is going away. It's um, the idea of renting a space in downtown Athens for like $60 to <laughs> start a rock and roll club or practice space. I mean, or $600. And um, I'm not really sure what the solution is, but I think that we as citizens all need to like make our voices heard and on an individual person to person level. Um, for the last four years, four years and November, starting November four years ago, I made the conscious effort that I was going to try and make some changes one person at a time um, because I was uh, pretty crushed by some, uh, by the public, by the realization that a large percentage of the public felt differently about things than I do. And um, I think locally, that's what we got to do because um, it's going to be hard on our local businesses to recover from COVID. And so um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think it's important. And, you know, we, unity, we got to do it. Right on. Yeah. yeah. I have a, just a few things to say about all of that. There are some movements. One of them is uh, NEVA, Save Our Stages. And also, uh, for instance, the 40 Watt Club, there is a fund to help um, the people who work there. And, you know, the best of times, it's hard to get by, you know, working at these clubs and we don't want to lose those people. Also, uh, to Montu, I think that we really need to make sure that everybody knows that racism and anti-women uh, and anti-gay and anti-anything is totally uncool. We're all people and we share the same planet. And what David is saying about having unity, our country has been torn apart, we've been polarized by people that are speaking to the lowest common denominator. Most people are not extremists. Most people are somewhere in the middle. And it, you know, speaking as a nurse, I've seen people bleed. I've seen them sick and we're all the same underneath. We all want the same things. Uh, we want our families to be happy. We want to be happy. And how can we do that? Well, what David is saying is really true. Going one-to-one -one and also not allowing people to say those types of things, make it okay, speak up. I mean, you don't have to be nasty about it, but you go, um, excuse me, but let's not talk like that. That's, that's bad or that's rude, you know? I hate to tell people what to think or do, but you know, I had an aunt who said, there's so many kids, nobody ever really taught them how to act. You know, let's teach each other how to act. Right let's be kind yeah. let's bring kindness back let's bring it back in a big way and i think that would be a good start and uh if you have a few extra pennies you know if we all give a little um to like uh save our stages and the people with the 40 watt or you know instead of buying something on amazon uh get a curbside delivery from you know one of our local stores they'll come out and bring it out to you you know just these little things make a big difference yeah so i'm off my safe box thank you vanessa and thank you everybody and i i see uh i see uh blair dorm and he's got some uh, some some uh advice about this in the chat everybody can look can look there to to see what he's got to share um and we're going to wrap this up, um, but really quick while uh, while while we have you all here, and particularly while while Montu, while you're here, I'm, I mentioned earlier when I introduced to you that you've got a uh, uh, you're working on a project um, with mm -hmm. with Ed Pavlich uh, yeah. for the uh, on the the DJ summits. Uh, project and you you guys are putting together a compilation album mm -hmm. uh, for for that that's that's going to be the, the long awaited third installment of uh, of the DJ summits uh, project that that uh, that finally has has formed now um, do, do you want to want to tell us a little bit about that and I, I I'm going to want to talk to you about maybe uh, 
arranging some kind of event about that in the spring that sure. we'll be able to tell folks about at some point. So it's, it's going to be Athens everything. We're using Athens um, producers. All the songs were recorded in Athens um, studios, um, all, all hip hop including the cover, everything's going to be all Athens. Um, I just basically paired, I did these weird pairs of, of artists and we got six songs. It's super dope. I actually have a, a studio session tonight um, and then two Saturday. So we're, I've got one song done and I'm hopefully do one tonight, a couple this weekend. So we're, I'm trying to have it done like in the next month or two, you know, and it's just going to be super dope. Um, it's going to be a, uh, uh, family friendly it's going to be you know um it's one thing that i'm starting to do with a lot of my um my projects is just make sure there's no curse words and just i want you to hear the message i don't want you to get lost in the you know the other stuff even though you know sometimes there's you need a cuss word but um but anyways it's going to be a great project so just look out look out for just look out for everything that athens hip-hop is doing right now um and i i, I would do want to say you know salute to the uh to the wilson center because y'all y'all doing some beautiful things and I know it's not hot. I know it's not easy over there at UGA, but y'all are at least, you know, trying to knock down some of these walls that's been built for ever. So y'all are at least trying, and I, I definitely appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Matu, and we're 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 really excited to to work on stuff like like what you're doing, and and which which we I should I should reiterate that is that that is possible because of a grant we got from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, and that that's a research grant which we are so happy to be able to uh to 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 turn research toward the community uh and and make that make the resources available to the, to the university uh work in this community to to really try to try to turn turn what we do outward um and that's another one of those barriers that we're talking about um we're uh, we're working on it everybody thank you so so very much um i i i, I, I can only speak for myself but I, I i have enjoyed this so immensely more than anything that uh that i have that i've done in the online space uh since this whole thing uh knocked us off our games um but uh Vanessa Briscoe, hey, David Barbie, Montu Miller, Grace Elizabeth Hale, y'all. Oh, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> so this is this is this there is volume go. one. We're working on volume two right now. I got the Creature Comforts grant. So volume two will be out in January. But support local hip hop. We'll support all of them. Support everybody. <laughs> support Athens. Thank you. There we go. And Grace, thanks so much. And hey, all you participants, why don't, why don't y'all stick around a little bit? Here's a, here's Grace's Grace's book, if you can see it. I don't know if I'm up on your screen or not. But um, Grace Elizabeth Hale, this the this all comes down to you. We've been we've been trying to do something about this book with you since long before it came out. So thanks, thanks to you uh, for 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 being the 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 spark that that lit this up, um, so great. Thank you for doing this, uh, Dave, and thanks to Montu, Vanessa, and David Barbie for joining us to talk about all this tonight. This has been fantastic. Um, thank you, and thanks to everyone who came. Yeah, thanks all, all of y'all. And let's have a real party in Athens post-pandemic. Yes. Yeah. For <laughs> real. All right. <laughs> Stay tuned. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.